Thanks. Yeah, just before uh, just before Romish prayed, the Lord was telling me that uh, uh, He's already there and He's preparing our hearts. Um, so I, I confirm what Ronish said, and that uh, um, that He's preparing our hearts, and that when you go there, Sereka, you're going there uh, in, a, in 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 help me, Lord. You're going in there uh, in the power of the Holy Spirit, and by you just being there. Just being there, the Lord says that they will be aware. They will be aware of the presence, even though they don't know what it is. They'll just be aware. The fact that you're there, they will be aware that there's something. There's something there. And as you speak, as you as you speak, because yes. God is already prepared the heart. And as you speak, that word, that word will get into them. And I just Amen. that's what the Lord said to me just before Romish prayed. Yeah. May I share something as well? Sure. Um, I, I wrote when, when you asked for prayer, and it's, it's come back to me as we've been talking and listening to one another, that um, we, we can be so fixed on what we know is the prognosis and diagnosis, what has already been said, that he is on his deathbed, that he's got a family of atheists, um, and, you know, it, it, Jesus even... Jesus on occasions had to clear unbelief out of the room. Um, my feeling is that even though we know, humanly speaking, that his destination is probably um, very short, um, the, the, the death potentially is imminent. I, I remember you giving testimony about how you prayed for Sean. Mm. Um, and I feel it's appropriate to say um, especially as and when are you driving down or coming by train? I'm driving down. Right to to spend the whole of that time in communion with the Lord, just praying in tongues, and allow the Lord to guide your steps and prompt how you speak. Obviously, you have thoughts in your head, but all our thoughts, unless they are absolutely in tune with the Holy Spirit, are going to have some kind of carnality to it. We've got the news that He is going to die we we know what the humans human beings are saying and there's a lot of evidence that with what he has then that's what's going to happen but it is still from the knowledge the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that we have that knowledge if you had simply taken the knowledge to heart over sean you wouldn't have prayed but that importance to you of um, giving the whole thing over to God and because nothing else was going to work you you prayed in the spirit that bypassed like Richard not knowing why he was prophesying the golden um, corn it bypassed your knower but it was speaking out the words that the Lord gave you and as you prayed in the spirit there was an outcome that was magnificent now it's, it's, it's kind of dangerous to think because you did it, then you will. But equally, to go to the tree of life and say, Jesus, the resurrection and the life, the one who died and sacrificed himself for us. It says that Paul, Paul says he preached nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. And there were no wise and persuasive words. Well, I know he's going to die. There, there was nothing other than him preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified and signs and wonders followed. Now, I, I got no intention of putting a heavy on you. Mm. Oh, you know, now you've got to expect signs and wonders. But I can bring back to remembrance your testimony regarding yeah. Sean. Yeah. And, and the fact is that it was the spirit of God that led you in prayer to the fact that you've now got a very sturdy, strong young man um, in your family. And... It isn't beyond the ability of God to yeah. turn Ken around, but it's not down to you. It's all down to him. And anything that you speak and utter in the spirit is for the Lord to translate in the way that right. he will. Yeah. Even this morning, I said, Lord, you know, you know, you can turn this around and clear the cancer out yeah. of his body, but uh, it's what you want. And um, so, um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, guys. Hmm. Richard, <laughs> Hi. 
Well, thank you for that lead in, Paul, because uh, that, that's one of the verses I've actually got to share today was about uh, Paul only knowing about Christ and Christ crucified. So that's <laughs> thumbs up for that. But for, uh, I was kind of w waiting on the Lord what to sh what to talk about today. And, and I kind of just some of this is just going to be testimony. And I believe one of the things that I want to testify about is how God can answer prayer in incredible ways. And I'm going to give you a, a, one testimony and then I, I, I'm hoping I'm going to talk, talk if it, it depends where it goes, because I, I, I don't plan it. I just go all over the place. So you, you'll see, <laughs> <laughs> you know, where we end up, who knows. Um, many years ago, I was, a, I, I mean, some people have problem children. I was a problem child. I was not only a problem child for my parents. I was a problem child for God. I, I, you know, God has had to have infinite patience and work with me because for whatever reason, every time he got hold of me, I'd run away. <laughs> and he kept getting hold of me and I kept running away. He first got hold of me when I was 15. Um, and then I ran away from him. And then he got hold of me, I think, when I was about 19. And then I ran away again. And eventually he sort of pinned me down when I was about 21. But I still, I think I still left again, ran away from him. I had this propensity to run away. Now, you know, you, you see people and you see them as they are now, but you don't, there's a history to everybody. And my history was that, you know, I was a troublesome person, you know. And one of these periods was I, 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 I sort of, went away from the Lord and I got married and I married a, a non-believer. The, the one thing that you should never, ever do. <laughs> this was my first marriage. You know, you should never marry. They all say, don't be unequally yoked. Well, I, I, I did. And um, it was, and, and then of course I got right with the Lord and, and then I was unequally yoked. So I, I was living in a very difficult, painful, it was very painful, probably one of the, one of the most painful periods of my life because my wife would go off to the discotheques and stuff and she'd be out half the night and I'd be at home not knowing what she was up to. Um, I'd come home sometimes and all my books would be out in the street. <laughs> basically threw them out the, out the door, all my Christian books. She was really, really anti, um, anti the Lord, you know. Um, so I, I had this, you know, very difficult situation. And I used to spend hours and hours and hours in prayer, you know, saying, so, I'm sorry, please get me out of this one, you know, kind of, you know, save her, you know. Um, and I would cry to God to... Um, to save her and eventually she agreed to come with me to a a bible week and i was really you know she'd agreed to come to a bible week this was a major major breakthrough you know and um i i kind of you know was was hoping that this this was going to be it you know this is going to be it anyway we went to we went to a couple of the meetings and it's and it rained you know can it, we went camping and, you know, you, you take your wife camping in a little tent and it just rains and rains and the water starts coming in the tent. And, and then, of course, she wants to go home. And I'm thinking, oh, my word, you know, what's happened here? You know, we, this is not turning out the way I would planned it. You know, I, I was kind of hopeful. So anyway, we managed to move out of that tent and somebody gave us some room in one of the big tents they had. So we, we managed to get out of our waterlogged tent. Anyway, we went to a meeting one night and we were one day and we were coming back from the meeting and she suddenly got really, really excited. And she said, look at that cross in the sky. And I said, what cross in the sky? She said, look at that cross in the sky. I said, that's just a couple of bits of cloud. What are you on about? You know, and I, I, I really didn't get it. You know, she was as absolutely excited. She said, I must tell people. And it was two little wiggly bits of cloud that were crossed. And, you know, it wasn't, to me, that's just a natural phenomenon. It wasn't anything that I would call supernatural. Do you, you know what I mean? I mean, I don't know if you ever see Facebook people put up pictures and say, oh, there's a picture of a, an a, and you're looking at it and you go, where? <laughs> you know, there's the genuine and there's the, there's, the, there's the kind of wishful thinking. You know what I mean? 
anyway, I, I grabbed all these, she grabbed these people out of the tent, you know, and we had an audience of about six people staring at the sky at these two little wiggly bits of cloud that didn't look like much. But as we watched, it turned into a phenomenal three-dimensional cross in the sky. I've never seen anything like it. It was actually square, it had shadow, it was three-dimensional in the sky. I still don't understand how she knew before it happened. I, I, I don't get that. I don't understand that. It, but, but suddenly there is a very, very real cross in the sky. I mean, you couldn't have made it out of clouds. It had, it was perfectly, you know, you would have had to use a protractor to draw it, you know, and get the angles 90 degrees and get all the shading in the shadows around the cross. It's not possible to do that. That's just not, it's something that's not, a, it's not a natural phenomenon. It's not possible. It was a supernatural miracle. And um, I just looked at it and thought, wow, you know, and um, unfortunately the only person who managed to get a photo was as it disappeared. It didn't stay long. It sort of just merged back into the, it was made a cloud, but it just merged back in. It sort of melded back into the cloud. Um, and I often wonder, well, there was, there was hundreds of people at this Bible camp. Well, did everybody else see it, you know? Did, it, did only us see it? I didn't hear any reports of anyone else see it. Did God keep everyone else distracted? I don't, I don't know how these miracles work. You know, I'm not trying to explain how it worked, but it was, and it's not the only sign that I've seen in the sky. Um, I've seen a lion in the sky as well, but but that was, that was phenomenal, you know. And of course, immediately she ran in the tent and gave her life to the Lord, you know. Um, and for her, it was a confirmation that the message was true um, and that she needs to give her life to the Lord. I looked at it and I thought, the cross, what, what, what is the cross? All? I mean, I was a Christian, but I said, what is the cross all about? I don't really get the cross. And I kind of, I sort of scratched my head, why the, why the cross? And it might sound strange that I was a Christian, but I didn't really understand the cross. You see, I think sometimes we, we, we're Christians and we just come along and we accept certain stuff and we but we don't really have an in-depth understanding of it. That comes with years of experience and prayer and study that we begin to really get to grasp what our faith is, you know, because the cross to me is the center of the Christian faith. You know, as Paul mentioned, he said, I would know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. Paul said, this is the most important message I have. You know, is, this is what I would share with you above all else. I share Christ and him crucified. He also said, I would boast about nothing except in the cross of Christ, by whom I have been separated to the world and the world been crucified to me. So the cross is this central thing that separates our faith from every other religion in the world. For instance, for one reason is that the cross is an end to any of our attempts to save ourselves. It draws a line under that. It says that somebody else had to pay the price for us, that we couldn't earn it, that we couldn't pay for it, we couldn't contribute to it. It was the work of God. God sent Jesus to pay the price for us so that we would be saved. And that destroys any ability for anybody to boast. Nobody can boast that they saved themselves. They got themselves to heaven through their own effort, for their own ability, through, you know, that they were able to save themselves. The cross destroys that because the cross says Jesus needed to die for you. You were in such a mess. Humanity was in such a condition that, that it took God becoming man, entering into the human race to fix the human predicament. Man was not in a position to fix the human predicament. He was indebted. He was in debt. He was in sin. He, he was lost. But the cross also, as I've come to understand, is a manifestation of the character of God. We can think that the cross is a sort of one-time event that just happened at a particular time in history. 
But that's not really what the cross is. The cross is a manifestation of the very nature of God. That God is a giving sacrificial God. That in the very heart of God, you know, there's this, there's this depth of love that would go to the cross. And, you know, even though Jesus rose from the dead, the cross is still the basis of his authority. Because it's what makes him God is the fact that, you know, he has that at the center of his character. You know, it's a manifestation of the character of God, the, sacri the sacrifice of God. And it's also a statement about the wickedness of man at the same time. Because we see that the cross reveals the extent to which man is opposed to God. It reveals the extent of man's condition and the darkness of, his, of the human heart, you know, that God came to earth as a man and man's reaction was to nail him to a tree. I mean, that just shows you the lost position humanity is in, that if God comes to the earth as a man, the human reaction to that is to crucify him. And that, that, that really speaks about our, our, our condition. Now, the cross is the position, you know, um, from which Jesus gained all authority. By dying on the cross, he took back the authority and established his authority as the head of the human race. So not only was the cross... Um, a manifestation it, it, it's it's the basis of our victory it's the basis of our authority it's the basis of our redemption it's the root of everything and you know as it says in john's gospel it says if i be lifted up i will draw all men to me i believe that you know that there is some sometimes we are tempted to be intellectually, um, what's the word, um, acceptable, you know, we, we want to, but as Paul said, you know, I, I, I don't do that. I preached across it. So this is, even if, even though it's a stumbling block to people, I don't try to appeal to people's, you know, um, appeal to people's intellect. You know, I preached across, because it's foolishness that to them that have been perishing, but it's it's to those that have been saved, it's the wisdom of God. Let me just get that scripture, because I know sometimes I'm I'm tempted to do this, you know, to try and make a big intellectual argument about stuff. But it says, um, "Oh yeah, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not in cleverness of speech." So that the cross of Christ would not be made void, not in cleverness of speech, so it doesn't lose its power. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. You know, and, and this, this is the cross. This is where all the obstacles, all the um, barriers that would separate us from God were removed. It says all the it says in Colossians that everything that was outstanding. Let me read the verse in Colossians. Colossians somewhere. Do, do, do. I'll put it in my notes and now I've lost it. <laughs> Strange. Oh, here we go. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having cancelled the charge of our legal indebtedness. So our legal in our debts, all the all the transgressions that were marked up against us and that were standing against us, he he, he cancelled them, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed 
principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So he, he basically defeated Satan. Now, understand the power of God. God is so powerful that he can leave heaven, become a man, allow himself to be crucified, and through that moment of extreme vulnerability and weakness, destroy all the principalities and powers. That's how much more powerful God is than Satan. He could come and allow himself as utter in his utter weakness and brokenness and apparent defeatedness <laughs> on the cross. At that very moment of place of extreme vulnerability and weakness, he defeated all the principalities and powers. Imagine if he really flexed his muscles. <laughs> <laughs> This is, this is the power of God. I mean, God wanted to show the principalities and powers just, just how much superior he is in every possible way to them. Because he could defeat them without lifting a finger, basically. He could defeat Satan and, and he could defeat sin and he could defeat all the powers of darkness without lifting a finger and the cross is 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 the glory of god it's a glorious demonstration of who god is and we we do well to study the cross i mean since that day in that field where i saw that cross you know i've had that question raised in my mind for somebody else it was the it was the answer to you know this then that they're understanding that it's true but for me, it wasn't. I already knew that the Bible was true, that Jesus was true, but I didn't understand the cross. And I still don't understand fully, but I'm, I'm digging. You know, I'm digging. I'm, I'm digging uh, into that. Um, I'm digging into that. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to find out more because, you know, this is, this is the real hub of Christianity. Mm. It's interesting that, you know, um, you know, I always talk about the Muslims, but the Muslims, one of the first things they did when they invaded any countries, they would just rip the crosses off the top of the churches. Mm. Um, they absolutely hate the cross. Mm. The devil hates the cross. He hates the message of the cross mm. because it's humiliating for him because he was defeated at the cross. He was destroyed at the cross. His very, what he thought was his moment of triumph was actually the moment of his defeat. And so we have to understand that that's really, you know, um, the basis of our message. And, and we have to keep coming back to the cross. Mm. We, we don't get, we don't outgrow the cross. We don't outgrow the message of the cross. It doesn't become a secondary message. You know, that's why Paul said, I would know nothing amongst you except Christ and him crucified. Mm. And it's the place of deliverance. It's the place of exchange. It's the place where we give our rags to Jesus. And he gives us his robe of righteousness. It's that place of exchange where we give to God all our failings and our weaknesses. And in return... And in return, we get back his robe of righteousness. We get in return, we get the treasures of heaven. And what a demonstration of the love of God. You know, we are the bride of Christ. And Jesus purchased us. It says in the book of Revelation that he purchased us with his blood. Mm. He paid with his blood for his bride. Mm. You know, he, he was willing to pay the price to have his bride, you mm. know, and he was willing to demonstrate how much he considered her to be worth mm. to him.
through the blood of Jesus. We, we were looking at Sunday on the book of Revelation and the beast and the, the, the harlot and how the beast, once he had used the harlot, just turned on her and destroyed her. And what a difference that is to Christ and the church. <laughs> you know, what an, you know, how Jesus loves the bride and was willing to die for the bride. And the antithesis to that in the world is that the world uses the bride, the woman, to get to his, but Jesus was the one who was willing to die. So there was two things I wanted to really bring to our recollection. One is that, you know, to remind us of the cross. I don't think we, we can ever, we always need to be reminded about the cross, you know, that that's the position on which authority is established. And for us too, as, as believers, um, we have to recognize that, you know, we have to be crucified with Christ. We have to, we have to identify with that crucifixion. You know, that's our, that's, we too have to follow that path. You know, Jesus has done it. We can't do anything to add to Jesus's death on the cross, but we do need to identify with it, you know. As it says in Romans 6, you know, I've been crucified with Christ. You know, it's nevertheless, it's not I, well, it's Galatians 2.20. Nevertheless, it's not I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. You know, we recognize that that's the source of our authority. That's the source of our position. That's the source of our salvation. That's the source of our redemption. That's the very root of who we are as believers. So that's it, really. That's today's, that's all I want to share with you, just to encourage you. And the other, the other thing, of course, was that prayer... I mean, I just shared with you one story where after a long period of prayer, it was answered in a, a supernatural phenomenon. That's not the only time that's happened for me. And I, I, I believe God wants to impart to us faith to believe for supernatural answers to prayer, that God can answer our prayers in ways that we, you know, he, he, can, he can reverse situations in a moment. I've seen him do that. I've seen him change situations that seemed impossible you know i mean that seemed like an impossible situation i was being a you know i mean th th there was not much movement going on <laughs> in in the situation i was in and yet in a moment he changed it by a miraculous supernatural sign yeah and I, I think of my my Very son. Profound. I think of my son. My son was not um, following Jesus um, through various mess ups I'd made, and same situation. I prayed and prayed and prayed, and um, there was nothing else I can do. There are times in life when you can't talk to people. Talking doesn't work. <laughs> you know and, and much as you want to talk the more you talk the more you push them away yeah you, you know you're you actually talking you're actually just pushing them further and further away so sometimes you just gotta shut up and pray <laughs> and so i used to just lock myself you know i used to get up and wake up in the middle of the night and pray sometimes i'd, I'd hardly sleep um and, and i would pray and one day my son was in, in a house and he was in the room and he just, the Holy Spirit just filled him and he ran out into the street speaking in tongues. <laughs> he just ran down the road speaking in tongues. Just, just came out of nowhere. He just suddenly the Holy Spirit just hit him and he ran out of the door speaking in tongues. Right. Amazing. Um, Amazing. And, and I just want to encourage you to believe that God, even in impossible situations, mm you know if we don't give up in prayer god can god will intervene you know Amen. but you do have to believe that god's going to answer you see it says pray believing you know you might not know how the answer is going to come most times we don't know how the answer we may not be able to predict how it's going to come but we can keep praying believing you know 
Can I throw you a curveball this time, Richard? You can throw me anything you like. Paul. You said even, <laughs> you said even in impossible situations. I, I think the word needs to be only in impossible situations. Each one of us is impossible, but not for God. Yeah. Only in impossible situations. In fact, the ones that get there easily potentially may not have got there because they've missed the fact that it's the impossible being made possible. That's why he says, whosoever believes in him shall not perish. You yeah. believed that was enough to pray. The possibility, the impossibility became a possibility because you prayed, because the Lord released in you the words. But it's an impossible situation for you. As you said, you couldn't say a thing to your son that was making a difference. You talk to God again, tree of life rather than the knowledge of good and evil. And there you have a salvation. It's only in impossible situations that God can come through. That's the impossibility of the cross. If it were any other way, we could then define it and it wouldn't be God. It's only impossible, not even impossible. Right. Okay, I'll stand corrected. Well, no, it's my <laughs> challenge, but it, 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 <laughs> well, it's just... Fine, yeah, I accept, but, I accept, I accept yeah. correction. But well, it, I don't, I don't. I'm not sure they're wise and persuasive words. I'm just saying that that's how I hear it, because I, I, I feel that all of us are impossible. And then God takes hold of us by the scruff of the neck and makes a possibility out of the impossible. So I, I think I think your word is superb, but it was that kind of even. No, it's always. Yeah, absolutely. And, and sorry, on the back of this, that I, I, I wrote that the cross is a signpost to salvation. Mm. And the cross literally, I, the, key, he, the Lord keeps giving me pictures of north, south, east and west at the moment. The, the good news goes in all directions, all points of the compass. The, the head of the cross is Jesus himself. The foot of the cross is where we need to be in submission. And the east and the west is where he removes our sin as far as the east is from west when we are, when we are contrite. And, and that is oh. the shape of the cross. All right. And it, it's just, the Lord keeps on speaking. I don't know if you know, noticed, but the Holy Spirit was touching me as you were teaching. The word is superb, but it absolutely epitomizes the fact that, and we need to be careful because the universal church is meant to be some kind of cult thing. But the, the offer of what Jesus did is universal. Yeah. Every person has the opportunity, but whosoever's doesn't include, doesn't exclude anybody. It can be um, President Xi Ping or whatever his name is in China. It can be um, the, the, the toughest KGB agent in in the Kremlin, it can be the worst pimp that's ever existed. He he takes the impossible and makes it possible. And he showed it with Saul of Tarsus. He showed it with Nebuchadnezzar. He showed it with the thief on the cross. He showed it with the Philippian jailer. He showed it with Rahab. He showed it, and obviously some of those are post, post-crucifixion, but of course in time, um, the Lord is timeless. But the, the, it's a signpost. It's a signpost to salvation. And just bringing it up to today and where Sarika's going, you're going to end up at Charing Cross. And Charing Cross was the final physical resting place of a, of a, of a queen who was brought, brought through Banbury Cross and Waltham Cross down to Charing Cross. But that's a physical resting place. The cross has an eternal significance to Ken in that hospital. And that's where you're going with the knowledge of Jesus Christ and him crucified. Amen. Amen.